Well, as, our, as is our habit, would you stand with me, if you're able, for the reading of the Bible today. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 is what I will be reading, and you can just look at it on the screen. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will remain forever. Let's pray one more time. God, I just dedicate this service to you. I dedicate this sermon to you. God, I pray that you would help me to speak your truth. That God, I just pray that you would help me if there's anything that is of me, that I would just get out of the way. But God, whatever it comes from you, my friends here would just remember it, that they would hold on to it, that they would believe it and live it. So God, it's in your precious name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Will not a righteous God visit for these things? The well-known abolitionist Frederick Douglass in his uh, autobiography reflects on his early life as a slave. And his account tells many horror stories of what it was like living in the antebellum South and during that period. But uh, as Douglas puts it, if any one thing in my experience more than another served to deepen my conviction of the infernal character of slavery and to fill me with unutterable loathing of slaveholders, it was their base ingratitude to my poor old grandmother. You see, Douglas's grandmother served her master his entire life. She was his nurse when he was an infant. She bore and raised her own children, who then had her grandchildren, her, her grandchildren, all of whom would go on to work on the master's plantation, making him a, a vast amount of wealth off of the backs of unpaid labor. And up to his dying day, she attended to the master. But following his death, she was sold off to strangers, who quickly determined that in their eyes, she was of no value. So they took her out into the middle of the forest. They placed her in a makeshift shack. And they left this frail little old lady, whose body was plagued by aches and pains, out in the wild to fend for herself. They left her out there not just to die, but to die alone. It was a horrible fate for a slave so faithful. And it's in the face of this injustice that Douglas asks a profound question. Will not a righteous God visit for these things? In other words, will God allow this kind of evil to go unpunished? Won't God bring true justice upon those who deserve it? Will not a righteous God visit for these things? And obviously none of us can come close to understanding what it would be like to watch someone we love be mistreated in this sort of way. But my guess is we all have at one time or another asked a version of this question in the face of injustice. Like when you turn on the evening news and you see innocent people dying in Ukraine because of Russia's lust for power. Or the Hamas using Palestinian citizens as human shields. You have to ask yourself, will not a righteous God visit for these things? Or when you think about the innocent women and children being sex trafficked, or the thousands of unborn babies who have never been given the chance to live because of abortion, you might say, will not a righteous God visit for these things? Or when prosperity preachers embezzle the funds of poor people, or when a pastor or a priest abuses the people in his care, We should ask, will not a righteous God visit for these things? It's sickening when you look at the world around you and you see evils that are committed yet unpunished. 
And it causes within all of us this craving, this longing for true justice to be served. And as we look at our passage today, we will wrestle with this same question. Will not a righteous God visit for these things? Will God be a righteous judge? And as we will see, the answer is yes. Yes, he will. Well, this is our fourth week in our series called Grow in Grace. If you have your Bibles, you can open them to 2 Peter chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, uh, you can download the YouVersion Bible app on your phone. You can log into our guest Wi-Fi and do that. Um, we're on 2 Peter chapter 2. And so far, we have read all of chapter 1 in 2 Peter, in which Peter has encouraged us and reminded us to make every effort to keep growing in the faith, keep cultivating our faith through Christ-like qualities. And so far, his words have been very encouraging, very uplifting. But now that we get to chapter 2, the mood of this whole letter begins to darken. Because remember, one of the primary purposes of this letter is to confront false teachers that have made some pretty audacious claims. Most notably, the claim that Jesus is never coming back. There is no second coming of Christ. He is not coming back at all. And therefore, there will be no final judgment. And so what Peter is going to do in this passage is he's now going to confront these false teachers head on. And, and let me tell you guys, he does not pull any punches. During this Halloween season, his words are appropriately terrifying. But as we will unpack today, this is a scare that is actually really good for our souls to hear. So let's get into it together. We are in 2 Peter chapter 2, and I'm going to begin in verse 1. <clears throat> but false prophets also arose among the people back in the Old Testament, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. So from the end of chapter 1, where Peter is talking about true prophets, he smoothly transitions into chapter 2 by bringing up false prophets. And here he says that, though back in the Old Testament there were a lot of true and incredible righteous prophets, there are also plenty of fake ones too. In the same way, though there are genuine teachers in your congregation, Peter says, there have and there will be charlatans. And the primary point that Peter makes is in these first three verses is that the end result reaped by corrupt leaders is destruction. Because they have and they will try to destroy you in some way. They will try to destroy your life financially, exploiting you in the name of their own greed. Presumably, these prophets are making a lot of money teaching in these churches. And they are using these funds for some shady, sinful activities. And though this is bad enough, what makes matters worse is the content that they are preaching. They are teaching destructive heresies. They're trying to destroy your life spiritually. They're trying to tear down the true faith of these believers by spreading false doctrine, which breeds doubt and confusion. And what might surprise you, that if you look back at the Old Testament, if you look at all of the prophets in the Old Testament and all of the fake prophets specifically, a common thread that was present amongst all these false prophets is that they always had a good message to share. And this is opposed to the true prophets who are more often than not relaying messages of doom and gloom, prophecies concerning God's judgment for Israel's wickedness. For example, Jeremiah says that these prophets preach peace, peace, when there is no peace. And they make promises that sword and famine shall not come upon this land. But ironically, by sword and famine, these prophets 
shall be consumed. The prophet Micah also confronts these hypocritical charlatans, saying Israel's priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in our midst? No disaster shall come upon us. You see, more often than not, the good guys teach the bad news. They bring the bad news, and the bad guys bring the good news. But the problem is, is that the good news is actually fake news. That's the issue. And the same is true today. Right? I'm not one to name names, but there are plenty of faces of famous preachers who come to my mind who share nothing but sugar-coated spiritual candy for starving masses. They never preach about sin. They never talk about hell. They always make promises of health and wealth that aren't in line with Scripture. They constantly preach peace. When there is no peace. And you can see why they do this, right? Who doesn't love to hear a message about peace? Who doesn't love to talk about love? Who doesn't like health, wealth, and a fully stocked shelf, right? We are a fan of these things. These sorts of messages can really draw a crowd. As, as Peter himself admits, many will follow their sensuality. But when the cold, hard truth is neglected for a warm, soft lie, it's ultimately a heresy that will destroy lives. So here's some food for thought. When you go to church, when you read your Bible, what is being said from God's Word should probably make you at least a little bit uncomfortable from time to time. If the Bible in its entirety is truly being preached, there should be some passages in there that make you squirm in your seat when it's read. And to be honest, if I am being faithful to God's Word, there are going to be sermons that I don't want to preach. There are going to be topics that I don't want to talk about because the person that I am calling out the most in this room is me. The person who's being confronted for my issue is me. For the, for the issue is me. So there, there have been Sundays like that. I'm like, I don't want to teach this message because I'm not good at this. I'm struggling with this. You see, Scripture is a mirror that highlights all our flaws. And yes, we are firm believers in the good news of the gospel, but in order to accept the good news, we first have to embrace the bad news, and that is concerning our sin and God's judgment. But believe it or not, this is actually a really good thing, and I'll get to that in just a little bit. So not only do the false prophets make, uh, make a wreck of the innocent, but they also are ultimately making a wreck of their own lives. As verse 1 says, they bring upon themselves swift destruction. And then in verse 3, we are assured that their condemnation is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. Again, this is a shot that Peter is taking at these leaders who claim that Jesus isn't going to return. That God is never going to judge the wickedness of people. Right? Peter responds to this with the guarantee that God is not dead, nor doth he sleep, as the Christmas carol goes. But he backs up his pledge by providing some examples. So let's keep reading. Look at verse 4. He says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them, day after day he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority, bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. 
So Peter gives us three historical examples of times when God's judgment was served in response to wickedness. And the first example he gives is by far the strangest, at least for us. Because what Peter is referencing here is the perplexing passage of Genesis 6. And if you aren't familiar, Genesis 6 tells us that shortly after the creation of humanity, angelic beings descended to earth and married and had relations with human women. That's about as weird as the Bible gets. Like, that is weird. It's a strange passage. Now, what is clear from this is that this interspecial breeding was wrong in God's eyes. God had a problem with it. But what Genesis doesn't tell us is whatever happened to these rebellious angels. We don't hear what came of them. And so how does Peter know that they were judged for their sin? Well, to make this even more complicated, it seems to most scholars that Peter is referencing the interpretation of this event as found in a popular Jewish work of the time, a book called First Enoch. And in First Enoch, this event is outlined in more detail. It includes God's judgment on the angels for this act, which involves them being cast into darkness and being enchained. So again, for us today, we might think that this is just a really strange example for Peter to, to give to us. But for whatever reason, he assumes that his original audience knows and accepts this story to be true, which makes it an effective analogy for him to use. Needless to say, the point is that God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but he has and will judge them for their wickedness. Thankfully, he does provide for us some other examples that we are more familiar with, with the second being the account of Noah's Ark. You know, Noah's Ark is one of those stories that we grow up on uh, with, during Sunday school. We, you know, we're pretty familiar with it. We've learned it from infancy. And the way we were, we're taught it is that it's pretty peachy. Right? It's a cute little story. Like, cute little Noah and his cute little animals are on their cute little ark, and there's this cute little rainbow on top of them. In this interpretation, there's three arcs for some reason, but it's very cute. It's very cozy. But in reality, the account of Noah's ark is a deeply disturbing story. It's disturbing because people are so wicked and so corrupt that God sees them and he says that he's sorry that he made them. It's pretty profound that God would say that. And so God decides to send a, a massive worldwide flood, drowning everything and everyone. It was a slow death, right? These people died a slow death. The waters slowly rose, and they would climb higher and higher, and then eventually there was nowhere else to go, and so they would drown, which is just a terrifying way to die. As the flood account tells us, all flesh died that moved on the earth, including all mankind. Everything on the dry land and whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. If he didn't make it clear, no one on dry land survived. Everybody died. It's a cute story. <laughs> this was an ancient apocalypse, a nightmare, a terrifying example of God's judgment on the wickedness of humankind. And if that's not unsettling enough, Peter gives us one more example, Sodom and Gomorrah. These sister cities were known for their moral depravity, particularly their perverse sensuality and sexuality, hence where we get the term sodomy. God therefore rains down fierce judgment on the city, literally consuming it with fire and sulfur. God sent them the way of the dodo, right? He condemned them to extinction. Again, it's another jaw-dropping display of God's wrath. And the reason Peter is referencing these past examples of God's judgment is to warn his readers and warn us of the reality of God's future judgment. He says those ancient angels are still, to this day, being kept until the, the judgment. Sodom and Gomorrah stands as an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And in verse 19, he concludes by saying that God will keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day 
of judgment. In other words, God has punished, but he will also punish again. And as we talked about last week, Peter shares his testimony concerning the certainty of Christ's second coming. And for those who are in Christ, this will be a glorious day when Jesus returns. It will be filled with joy that Jesus has come back. But for those who are not, it will be a day, the Bible tells us, of fierce judgment. It's a somber reality for those who believe it's true. But as Peter points out, these false leaders think they have nothing to worry about. As he says at the end of verse 10, bold and willful, they do not tremble as they sin against God. They think Jesus is never coming back, and so they will never be accountable for their sin. And so they don't even blink an eye when they commit atrocities. Unfortunately for them, they are in for a rude awakening when the day arrives. As the psalmist says, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation or anger every single day. Let's take a time out here just for a second because this is a troubling thing for us to think about. Because maybe for you, you cringe at the idea of God as an angry judge. Like these accounts of God unleashing his wrath in epic proportions might be unsettling for you. It's unsettling for a lot of Christians, and it's especially unsettling for those who aren't Christians. In fact, it might be a big barrier for them to become a Christian. They don't understand how this is possible. But why is that? Why is God's wrath so troubling for us? Well, I think one reason is that God's anger seems to contradict his love, mercy, and grace. It seems incoherent that the God of the Old Testament, who drowns people in a worldwide flood and sends fire down from heaven, consuming entire cities, is the same Jesus who preached love and peace, who said, let all the children come to me, who preached about forgiveness even to the worst of sinners. Like, where was that mercy for Sodom and Gomorrah? Where was God's grace for the men, women, and children who drowned in the flood? Why does it feel like the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are two completely different people? We see that and it just doesn't register in our minds. But another reason why you might struggle with a God of judgment is because deep down inside you know that you and people that you love and care about are equally guilty of sin and even injustice. In an article by the Gospel Coalition from which I have received a good deal of inspiration for this message, the author observes that when we look at God's judgment, we become engulfed with a sense of a, the thousand different ways that we are complicit in injustice. We, met, we might not repeat racist jokes, but we don't say much when we hear them. We might not traffic sex workers, but we've watched porn that does. We might not steal from our neighbors, but we keep and spend money on ourselves we know we could give. We are enmeshed, as the Book of Common Prayer says, in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. The subject of God's wrath leaves us unsettled because we know that if Sodom and Gomorrah deserve to be consumed by fire, I do. People I know and love deserve to be consumed in that way as well. The subject of God's judgment is disturbing because there are people we know and love who very well may bear the punishment because they are in rebellion to God's will. It's disturbing. These are hard realities to grapple with, and I don't think there's an easy answer. But if I may, I'll try to the best of my ability to address them now. And, and to do that, I want to make the simple argument that God's mercy and his wrath are not, in fact, contradictory, but actually walk hand in hand. Because first of all, in this passage, we actually see God's mercy in the judgment. In verse 5, Peter writes that though God did not spare the ancient world, he preserved Noah and seven others 
Noah was not a perfect man by any stretch of the imagination, but he was a worshiper of the Lord and was not corrupted in the way that the rest of the world was. His life and his priorities were so different from his peers that Peter says he was a herald of righteousness. And so God honored his faithfulness and in the face of imminent destruction provided deliverance for Noah and his family. Even though God unleashed judgment on a wicked world, he showed incredible mercy to one righteous family. And this is even emphasized with Sodom and Gomorrah because even though God destroyed the cities, he rescued righteous Lot. Now there's a couple of things I want you to notice. First of all, If you know the story, you know that God was not quick to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, Abraham famously pleaded with God on behalf of the cities, getting God to promise that even if there are only ten righteous people in these cities of tens of thousands, that God would not destroy it. Literally, if there was .001% of the population that was righteous, God would not destroy the city. That sounds pretty merciful to me. But alas, there wasn't even 10. And as we've seen instances, we've also seen instances, if you look at the Bible, where God has withheld his judgment. Consider the city of Nineveh, right, from the story of Jonah, who was just as wicked as Sodom, but God spared them because they repented. Or what about 2 Kings 19, when God delivers the spiritually decaying city of Jerusalem from an invading Assyrian army on behalf of godly King Hezekiah? Even in the Old Testament, God is a God who provides second chances, even third and fourth chances, which confirms that God is, in fact, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So that's the first thing that, you know, God was not quick to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But did you notice that when Peter is talking about who God rescued, he rescued righteous Lot. He calls Lot righteous. But again, if you know the story, is this a word you would use to describe Lot? I certainly wouldn't. Right? The dude was a spineless, morally depraved drunkard who engaged in his own repulsive sexual perversion. Right? There's a famous story about that. I would make the case that the Lord, that, it, that Lot had become so corrupted by the city that God would have been justified to have kept him there when he destroyed it. In fact, it doesn't even make sense why God considered Lot to be a righteous person, at least from my perspective. But nonetheless, God rescued Lot. God showed Lot mercy. Showing someone mercy, by definition, is forgiving them even when they deserve punishment. Lot deserved punishment. He was undeserving, but God showed him mercy. As the Lord says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. And so even in the midst of judgment, we see God's mercy at work, being enacted to people, even people who don't deserve it. And truly, another thing to consider is that God judges because he is merciful. God judges because he is merciful. Remember the haunting question of Frederick Douglass? Will not a righteous God visit for these things? His question was a cry for justice, for God to show mercy towards the oppressed by punishing the oppressor. And when you consider God's acts of judgment throughout the Bible, we have to realize that he is always unleashing this vengeance on behalf of the women who are raped, on behalf of the children who are abused, the poor who are exploited, the people who were enslaved, the innocent who were murdered. God is acting on behalf of all those who are hurt by the sin of others. And whether we realize it or not, our sin makes the world a worse place to live. And God, as a righteous judge, will not let that slide. As the Gospel Coalition article puts it, In a world crooked and ruined by rebellion, I think deep down we all know we need a God who feels anger every day. 
We know it would be a greater tragedy if God never visited us, never visited for these things. We would be terrified to discover that he was an unrighteous judge who never condemned, never punished, never dealt with the crimes of the world. If that was God, he wouldn't be a judge at all. I think deep down we would all admit that a God who was never angry, who never made things right when there is injustice, would be way more terrifying than our God who sees the sin and the injustice of our world and weeps hot tears of anger that move him into action. We all at one time will pray the prayer of Psalm 10. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. Believe it or not, I would argue that you want a God of judgment. We need a God of judgment. We need a God who confronts evil in our world. But this doesn't solve your presumed anxiety surrounding your own guilt or the guilt of those you love. Which is why we must look to the old-time gospel and remember that in his mercy... God laid the judgment on Jesus. Though we deserved judgment, though we deserve punishment, God rescued us by sending his son to die in our place. Romans 8.3 says that by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, God condemned sin in the flesh. God's judgment for sin was unleashed on Calvary's tree. Because God is just, he did not let sin go unpunished, but because he is merciful, he bore that punishment himself. Earlier in Romans, the Apostle Paul explains it this way. He says, God presented Christ <clears throat> excuse me, as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his patience, he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. What Paul is saying, what he is saying brings all that we've talked about together. Because of his patience, God did not enact the full punishment of sin until the right time. He delayed the punishment, but he did not delete the punishment. Because true justice still needed to be served. Because he was righteous, he was going to enact justice. But because of his great mercy, he provided what the Bible calls the mercy seat. A sacrifice of atonement. And that is Jesus who died in our place and bore the punishment of our sin upon himself. And now the only thing that a person has to do to avoid judgment is to receive the free gift of grace by believing in Jesus through faith. If you have faith in Jesus, God justifies you. It is a great exchange that God has mercifully given to us through Jesus. And it's open to those who recognize their need for a Savior and who come to God fearful and trembling repenting of their sin and putting their hope and their trust in Christ, knowing that he will forgive them and redeem them. It is the free gift of grace, open to anyone who will believe it and receive it. But as we'll talk about later in this series, this invitation won't last forever. There is a short window of time for this. Because whether that's when your days are gone, when you die here on earth, or when Jesus returns again, the final judgment for wickedness will come. Time will run out. As the article concludes, will not a righteous God visit for these things? He did 2,000 years ago, and he will again. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Let's pray as we end our time together in worship. God, you are holy forever. God, you are sovereign over our world, and you are a righteous judge.
God, even though that makes us uncomfortable to think about, even though that is troubling for us to wrestle with, even disturbing, God, we know that you are a judge and you enact judgment because you are good. Because you love the world. You care for the oppressed. You long for justice. God, help us as we wrestle with that. Help us to in our hearts, reckon with your anger and your judgment. But God, also to help us to see how that does coincide with your mercy and your grace. God, we thank you that you are loving, that you are merciful. But God, we do praise you that you are just and that you do judge. And we thank you that if we are in Christ, that do judgment and punishment was laid on his shoulders. Jesus, we thank you for being our sacrifice of atonement, for standing in our place. And so God, we lift high your name this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.